my shoes and out the door. Five, I'm alive. Six, seven, eight, feeling great. Hello, Beyond Your Wildest Dreams tribe. I'm Dr. Noah DeCoyer, your co-host, and on behalf of my partners, Dr. Michael Akinfora and Dr. Wanda Lee McPhee, we want to thank you all for subscribing. As we search to 100,000 subscribers, we would like to show you our appreciation with three free gifts. In our show notes on iTunes and Podomatic, there are three separate links to each of our most latest ebooks Fermentation 101, Paleo Crockpot Style, and Whole Foods Harvest. Thank you again, and before you begin listening to this incredible podcast, don't forget to register for our upcoming summit, the Longevity and Anti Aging Project Living Healthy, Wealthy, and Wise, at www.antiagingproject.com. So, welcome everyone to Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. This week's guest is Dr. Amir Rashidian. He is joining us from Frederick, Maryland, United States. He has a Bachelor of Science in both Chemistry and Human Biology, as well as a Doctorate in Chiropractic. He is a speaker, consultant, and nationally published author, as well as being a chiropractor. He has over 15 years of clinical experience, and his practice has helped thousands of people every year. He regularly speaks at corporations, conventions, and churches, and has a passion for guiding people on a path to recovery and wellness. We're going to talk about his book today, The Stress-Proof Life, The Secret to Health, Wealth, and Happiness. Welcome to our podcast, Dr. Amir. Well, hello. Hello to you, Wanda Lee, and hello to the uh, wonderful audience of listeners you have. Uh, You know, I regularly run into people who tell me they they subscribe to your uh, program, and they, they love it, and they're such such wonderful people and obviously I'm a big fan of yours myself so uh, I'm very honored that I'm with you today. Well thank you so much. One of the things we like to give our listeners is a little chance to get to know you better to start with. So let's talk about your story, where you've come from, how you wrote the book and and why you became a chiropractor. You got it, you got it. When I was nine years old is when I decided I had to become a doctor and the reason for that was My dad and I were traveling through the remote villages of Iran in the mountains. And in in this one village, a woman went into labor. Uh, She was in tremendous pain, obviously having complications. People were standing around. No one knew how to help her. A midwife walked over. She knelt down and examined her for uh, maybe a minute or two, stood up and said, I am so sorry. There's no heartbeat. There's nothing I can do. And she left and, and uh, left that young woman alone in her husband's arms, uh, and, and that was it. And I'm, I'm looking in the eyes of this young woman who was just told she's not gonna live another few hours, and her husband just collapsed. He just started crying. Uh, how could this be? We were just about to start a family, and I've, uh, I felt so helpless. Uh, you know, if, if, if you've seen nine-year-olds cry, uh, you know, my throat was all choked up, my chest felt tight, I'm having trouble just catching my breath and tears are just flowing down my eyes and my dad saw me and he picked me up he held me he carried me out of there and uh, when I calmed down the, the two of us climbed down the mountain to get in our car and drive home on the way home dad I don't want to feel like that ever again you know I don't want to feel so helpless and he asked what are you going to do about it I said I'm going to go be a surgeon I'm going to be the best surgeon in the whole world I'm going to carry my medical bag with me everywhere I go and I'm just going to save lives and, uh, and that, that, that's where it started. Ten years later, uh, I was a student at uh, George Washington University, and I, I had the, the grades and the, you know, the list of extracurricular activities you have to have to, to get into a good medical school. And I was applying to the early selection program, wanting to start early. I was on track. I went home for Christmas break. Our house was now in Maryland uh, in the U.S. And uh, I walked in the door, and my dad had this big, giant, white neck brace on and he was on uh, some heavy painkillers you could tell looking in his eyes he couldn't lift his arms to give me a hug uh, and uh, and that started a journey of going from doctor to doctor trying to figure out what is wrong with my dad uh, dad can't dress himself he can't feed himself he can't uh, he can't even sleep he has to sit in a chair uh, because laying down is too much pressure on his neck so just imagine every night he's sitting in a chair all night by himself in the dark, waiting for someone to wake up and talk to him. And uh, Dad had this passion of writing. He had a pen and pad with him everywhere. He loved to write. And that was his hobby, just like someone might want to paint or draw or, 
or uh, play a musical instrument, but he couldn't hold a pen in his hand. His hands were completely numb and limp. And so we ended up in a neurosurgeon's office. This neurosurgeon said, you've got massive problems. It's been going on forever. What have you been waiting for? Um, we need to operate, and we need to operate quickly. He said, uh, you, um, you've got a chance you'll die under the knife. And I'm terrified. You know, Dad was 70 years old at the time. And, and, and I want to tell your audience, uh, there's such a thing as a young 70 and an old 70. So it's not the number, obviously. Plenty of people are 70. They're younger than I am uh, and, and vice versa. So, uh, you know, we were terrified because this doctor said, we, we're going to break and remove the bones in the back of your neck. We'll put rods and screws into your spine. We'll fuse your whole neck. You'll never turn your head again. You may not regain function of your hands. And we're hoping you have less pain uh, and, and there's a chance you won't survive. And we talked to two other neurosurgeons. They all agreed. We got in a taxi to go home after that third neurosurgeon. And, uh, and, and, and I look over at dad and I was carrying all the MRIs and, and x-rays. And, and, and I look over at dad. He's got his neck brace on. He's cringing because every bump that taxi hits is sending this bolt of pain through his body. And, and I can tell he wishes he was dead. So I get all choked up all over again like I did in that village where I watched that woman just die in her husband's arms. And, and I'm watching my dad uh, right in front of me, and, and I'm getting all choked up and teary-eyed. This taxi driver saw the two of us in his rearview mirror, and he said, uh, I know you asked me to take you home, but I can tell you're in a lot of pain. There's a chiropractor right down the street. Why don't you let me take you there instead? Well, the, the rest of it is history. We ended up at this chiropractor's office, and, and the chiropractor took us in and, and talked to us and, and read those x-rays and MRIs and CTs I was carrying in the back of that taxi and uh, said, hey, I can help you, and this is how we'll do it. And, uh, and uh, he did. Uh, six months later, my dad was able to uh, hold a pen and write again. He was able to take care of himself. My dad lived another 18 years. He lived to be 88 years old. And I'm telling you, at 88, dad was younger than when he was 70. At 88, he'd get up and take care of himself. He'd exercise, go visit his friends. All of them were in nursing homes, but not my dad. He was traveling. He was, he was enjoying his life. Dad lived long enough to be my best man at my wedding. He stood right next to me. He lived long enough to meet and hold my first son when he was born. And those 18 years are, are invaluable. So um, uh, naturally, uh, I looked at that and, and I wanted to do what that chiropractor did for my dad, is be a chiropractor, remove interference from the nerve system and allow that human potential to be expressed the way it did in my dad and, and in my whole family now today. That's why I'm a chiropractor. Well, that's a pretty powerful motivation and a, and a massive purpose to help people. Um, and everyone I am sure in your community and now around the world is gonna benefit from that. You went from, which you still do, your practice home in Maryland, but you also have written The Stress Proof Life. So let's talk a little bit about stress. What do you believe is the reason people want to avoid stress? Why is that a bad idea if they try to avoid stress? Absolutely, I'll, I'll tell you another uh, quick story just to, um just to get the whole idea of stress started is uh, uh, I grew up in Iran, obviously, you know, and in 1981, the air raids started. And uh, I remember that uh, uh, one night my mother said, hey, uh, you have to turn on your radio before you go to sleep tonight. And uh, we, we tur I turned on my radio, turned up the volume. There was no programming. It was silent. I went to, went to sleep. Uh, but a little after midnight, this loud siren blared through the radio and I just flew out of bed and with my family, we all went out the door and we were in this tall um, luxury apartment building. And we, we went down the hallway, ran down the hallway, ran down the stairs, all the way to the basement. Everybody else from the building were waiting there and it was cold and dark and, and, uh, and, and everybody was terrified. Then we heard the roar of this jet engine fly overhead. And the next thing we heard was the whistle of this bomb that had just been dropped. And this whistle was getting louder and louder as this bomb is just getting closer and closer. But you can't tell where it is. The whistle is way too high pitched. So all you can do is wait and hope and pray that that bomb is not right directly over your head. Uh, so uh, a, a few seconds later, big giant explosion. Our building shook and the lights flickered. 
but the bomb hadn't hit us and we were relieved uh, and and so I, I, you, you look at that type of stress and obviously uh, hopefully I expect none of our listeners here have been through something uh, uh, like that but I also expect everyone would agree stress like that over a long period of time would most definitely lead to uh, illness and and disease and it could take a toll on the body so I believe that's why people are uh, always trying to avoid stress stress itself you know the word was coined by Dr. Salier Dr. Hans Salier he, he did experiments on lab rats he found that they all when they're under stress they got the same disease as you and I do is, is uh, heart disease cancer stroke diabetes arthritis obesity they all got sick so the conclusion obviously would be that stress is bad but if you look deeper there are researches that actually show that stretches, stress is necessary. Like uh, there was a research on a uh, single cell organism called amoeba and they, they took away all their stress in these petri dishes. And uh, these cells all died early when there was no stress. So their conclusion is that life requires stress and stress sustains life. So the question is, is stress good or bad? And uh, like you, I, I, I've done a lot of speaking, public speaking and I've, I've talked to uh, audiences all around and, and I always want to ask them what do you think stress is it good or bad and uh, you, you know invariably the majority of people say stress is bad some people say it's good and uh, and um, you know and, and the rest of the people say it's both good and bad and uh, for, for me that question is like asking if gravity is good or bad or asking if money is good or bad or fire I mean you use fire to cook your food but it can burn your hands so does that mean it's good or is it bad um, it's really neither so stress gravity can make you fall down or you can keep your feet on the ground when, uh, you know when you're walking it's neither good or bad money is the same thing if, if you, you look at how money is spent by a terrorist organization to do evil you would say money is bad but then you look at all the philanthropy and and good things that come out of people who use money for for as a force of good uh, money is neither neither is stress and uh, and, and so we, we really can't avoid that stress uh, uh, one of my favorite stories if I may about stress uh, is Dr. Norman Vincent Peale he wrote the book uh, Power of Positive Thinking and uh, uh, it, he talked about how he was counseling one of his clients and the client said stress is the cause of all of my problems and if I didn't have any stress, I'd be happy. Uh, and Dr. Peel said, but would you like to meet some people who don't have any stress? And obviously, the answer is yes. He said, follow me. He said, where are these people? What do they do? What do they eat? What do they uh, say? And he said, just follow me. So he walked him all the way out onto a cemetery. He said, everybody underground here has no stress. And so really to avoid stress, if the goal is to reduce stress, it's similar to taking a step closer to that grave. That's not what we want to do. We want to excel. We want to grow. We want to succeed. And that's 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 my opinion about why we shouldn't really avoid stress. Well, let's give our listeners an idea about how the body deals with stress. So you give some examples in your book about the body's stress response. Let's explain that for people a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Think 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 about the, the, the bombing. And, and bombs fall in all our lives. You know, um, uh, the, a bomb could be a disease or, or, or a uh, tragedy or a loss it could be a bankruptcy or a divorce um, uh, or, or just hearing bad news or a big loud sound all of a sudden here's all of a sudden we're in the middle of an earthquake maybe uh, your pupils will dilate uh, your face will turn pale white you know blood will leave your face the blood will leave your hands and feet blood will rush to your big muscles so you can do what's called fight or flight uh, run away or fight to defend yourself uh, in that moment, your digestion will cease. Um, your bladder will stop working. Your uh, immune system will stop working. You're not worried about those things at this point. Just imagine if you're being uh, chased by a pack of hungry wolves. You're not going to worry about um, you know, whether you're digesting your food properly, and your body is the same way. And uh, so, so those are all good things because they sustain life. They, they help you survive uh, the cortisol that gets released also increases your blood sugar and so on what the problem is is that when you're not equipped to handle that type of stress sustained long term that that's when it becomes a problem in in the book I talk about the story of a school teacher her name is Lauren came 
and then and she said all i have is really neck pain but uh if you ask a few more questions she also had high blood pressure and high cholesterol which she was on medication for she had indigestion uh where she was uh given a uh over the counter uh, antacid because of the acid reflux she had constipation and they had given her an over the counter stool softener she had insomnia. She was prescribed a low-dose sedative to be able to fall asleep. And she always had these um, frequent head colds and sinus infections. And she couldn't get rid of that persistent belly fat. She just couldn't lose the weight. And, well, well you know, uh, you might think those are all separate things. And she's only here for neck pain. The truth is her job was super stressful. The type of school she was teaching and the students she was dealing with, the subject, the parents, the administration, there was a lot of pressure on her. And so obviously, just like being chased by a pack of hungry wolves or being dropped in a snake pit, your blood pressure will go up, but it should come back down when you're safe. Well, she was never in that safe environment, and her nervous system was telling her blood pressure to be high. We're telling her heart to pound harder to get more blood out. And, and why are her hands cold and her feet cold? And you've probably met people like that who constantly in the summer, my hands are always cold, my feet are always cold. Well, it's because they're probably in that fight or flight and they're stressed. And naturally, cholesterol goes up because it's the building block for a lot of your hormones. And um, uh, she's having all these colds and flus and uh, sinus infections because her immune system doesn't work well and her digestive system doesn't work well. So anyways, it was a happy ending and I don't want to get too far into that, but uh, uh, we were able to help her out and, and not just with neck pain, but but because we changed her ability to withstand the stress. Because what's the alternative? You think about this. Uh, is it that she was under too much stress or is it that she couldn't handle that stress properly? If she was under just too much stress, well, I'd say quit your job, go on welfare, um, and, uh, uh, and and live like that, uh, but th that doesn't sound like a solution. So we went, we worked the uh, the process to strengthen her, to stress-proof her life, so that that stress wasn't causing that sickness. Perfect for people who think that stress might be genetic. You know, my mom had a lot of stress, or she didn't handle stress well, and so I can't handle stress well. How do you handle uh, clients or patients who come to you and and have that kind of thinking? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, just look at identical twins who have uh, equal, um, uh, you know, I, I, identical genes. Uh, their genetic makeup is exactly the same. Uh, the twins could, could be under a lot of stress, and one of them will develop heartburn, and the other one will get tension headaches, or, or one of them will, um, will end up having high blood pressure, and uh, another one will end up just having tension in their neck and having pain. Um, we're all pre-programmed by our genetics. Uh, but those programs need to need to be turned on. They need to run. You know, uh, here's an example. Uh, uh, all of our listeners here, uh, I am sure there's a genetic program inside of them that, that tells them to sneeze, to cough, to vomit, to spike fevers. So you get the idea. So, But none of us are walking around all day and all, all night sneezing, coughing, and vomiting all over ourselves. Something causes that genetic program to turn on and be activated. And like, you know, we inhale some black pepper, we'll sneeze. Um, an irritant goes into our lungs, we'll cough. Well, that's a genetic program. We're not doing that. Same thing with, you think about cancer. You know, how many people are, are uh, struck with cancer? And, 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 you know, I know there's a genetic component to that. And I'm not um, discrediting the genetic predisposition to such a thing. But why is it also that there are some people who've had cancer in their family history who never get cancer and there are people who don't have any family history of cancer and do get the cancer? It's because of what we're exposed to and what genetic programs we allow to run. If we clean out the environment and our surrounding inside and outside of our bodies, the probability of that drops and our ability to handle stress increases. Uh, uh, I always talk about make an environment conducive to health and healing. Um, and and, and here's, a, here's an example we talk about in the book is if you go to the uh, National Cancer Institute website and, and read about how they do the research, they talk about how they use the mice. Uh, and and uh, mice, uh, they, they inbreed them, so they all have the same genes, and then they, they give them cancer, and then they study their genetic response. But how do they give them cancer? Well, uh, they, the, the, the website itself says they inject them with cancer cells or they radiate them or just that inbreeding process and, and it makes you wonder, well, if we didn't give them these toxins 
and radiate their bodies and inject cancer into their bodies would they still get that cancer is it really the genes that's causing that cancer so uh, uh, genetics are important but we can change the expression of our genes and uh, and and you know you're you're a bigger expert Juan Ali, than, than I am about this with um, with your research and all that you've uh, done through your podcast so um, definitely let's not say that we're trapped by our genes we can change how they're expressed absolutely that's certainly one of our um, most important messages that we hope gets across is is that people have genes but um, how those genes function is definitely up to them and uh, and although stress can certainly be a challenge how well you cope with that stress is the bigger piece and i think that's where your book has been so successful in the stress proofing concept and and helping people understand that as a chiropractor obviously we see a lot of people and help them with that so maybe you could help our listeners hear a little bit more about what chiropractic has to do with stress absolutely it's dependent on the nervous system so so your nerves are what bring information to your brain and when your brain processes that information it'll use the nerves to send that information out instructions to your body your organs your your glands your blood vessels your muscles your joints they all receive that information and so when there is something that interferes in that process and a common interference is problems in the spine um, through chiropractic adjustments we can remove those interferences and if the environment is correct and there's no interference you can handle your stress a whole lot better so so the, uh, the, the adjustment the chiropractic adjustment has to be a, uh, a part of your lifestyle a regular routine part of lifestyle not just cleaning the environment but enabling your body to process that environment properly through chiropractic absolutely and one of my favorite parts of your book is the section about the simple seven because one thing we know, obviously, as doctors is that we can help, but we're not with people 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's so many things that they can do to help themselves. So let's talk a little bit about your simple seven. You got it. Um, obviously, we probably don't have time to hit all of them, but uh, you know, we talk about exposure to sunlight and, and when does that become uh, toxic? When is it actually healthy for you? And why is it that um, some of the research is showing that synthetic sunscreens cause more skin cancer than the sunlight itself? Um, another one is, is exercise, and, and we, we go through some certain um, solutions for that. My, my focus was let's not give people too many things um, uh, or, or something that requires too much of their time because uh, I always say if, if brushing your teeth took an hour every day, I doubt everybody would brush their teeth. But the reason you could do it is because you can fit it into your routine. It takes just a few couple of minutes uh, and, and, and you can make it a habit that just happens automatically. Well, that's what my focus was with these things. So one thing I talk about is visualizing uh, uh, and visualizing yourself on vacation. What the, what the brain can conceive or imagine in, in vivid detail, the body can't tell the difference. And so you look at athletes who visualize their events before they do it. They're the ones that are most successful. I was reading about Michael Phelps, who, who has a visualization routine that is so detailed. He actually feels the water drops on his face as he comes out of the water at the end of a race. He's visualizing it in that much detail. And you, you look at the eight, eight gold medals that he won in the Olympics. Uh, incredible um, so, so we have examples uh, such as that about visualizing uh, music has such healing power and, and a typical song is uh, what three three minutes long um, I'll tell you a, a real brief story I had an aunt named Aunt Simi who was diagnosed with um, terminal breast cancer and she came over to the house and uh, uh, we, we were thinking she was gonna be really depressed and, and she's she's only got six weeks to live what should we do? Well, she walked over to stereo, and this is way back, you know, decades ago, where the stereos were these big giant things with big giant speakers on the sides, and there was a, uh, a bin on the bottom where all the cassettes were, and she put the cassette in the player, pushed the big play button, and, the, you know, the speakers came to life, and, and the music played, and she started to dance. And she, she grabbed my mom and my dad, and they started dancing in the middle living room, and they grabbed me and pulled me in the middle, and we're all dancing. And she said, you know, I'm, I'm only going to live six weeks. I'm going to dance to this song once a day, every day. 
as long as I'm alive. And she did that. You know, there were times where she was so tired, so weak, the chemotherapy, the radiation, people had to help her up to stand. But she did it every day. She danced to that song. And she still died of cancer eventually, but not for another 10 years. She actually got stronger. Her hair grew back. Her body recovered. She looked fine. She actually lived a good, productive, enjoyable life. Music is amazing. What if we all did that? We danced to music for three minutes once a day. Um, breathing is another one where uh, we, we can teach our body to breathe in a way that's conducive to healing. Now, I go through several exercises in the book, but just think about this as an example. When something bad is about to happen, we naturally uh, do what? Exhale or inhale? In inhale. Yeah, we, we, we inhale. I mean, suddenly you run into a bear in the woods. You go, <gasps> and yeah. you're scared. And on, on the other, so that's the stress response. But on the other hand, exhale is you breathe a sigh of relief. <sighs> that was me when I found out that bomb didn't land on us and it was somewhere else. You breathe a sigh of relief. So the more we slowly exhale, the better we are at dealing stress. And we talk about how to train your body to do that. And obviously, sleep is another one of the um, simple seven. Um, there's so many parameters that make a big difference. One I'll give you is sleeping in the pitch black darkness. Cover your alarm clock because uh, just like when your skin is exposed to sunlight, you, you, you produce vitamin D. If your skin's in pitch black darkness, you produce melatonin. Melatonin is required for your serotonin levels and dopamine levels, which are your feel-good hormones. And, and uh, if you're sleeping with a nightlight on, you're not going to get that. and You'll wake up not rested. So, again, we go through a few more of those, but that's my simple seven. That's a wonderful um, starting point for so many people, even if they pick one a week to, to implement and, and move their, their health and their stress capacity forward. I think that is so powerful, simple, effective, proven ways to help people just live better. Um, Absolutely. So when we look at the title of your book, it's called The Stress-Proof Life, The Secret to Health, Wealth, and Happiness. Obviously, we've spent the last um, several minutes talking about health, but where is the wealth and happiness piece of this rolling in? You know, uh, I've, I've been studying the human body for probably 20 years now and, um, and just studying that stress response and, um, and watching what causes stress and how people deal with it and how equipped they are. And I found out the number one reason people fail to reach their goals, their dreams, whether it's a health goal or a wealth goal or a business goal of some sort or a career objective, the number one reason they fail to reach it is because their bodies aren't equipped to handle the stress that comes with that. Anything worth doing has stress. If you're pursuing higher education, uh, Wanda Lee, you have multiple degrees. Uh, you have an impressive resume. Were, uh, were your um, education, was your ex educational experience completely stress-free? Absolutely not. Y yet you were able to handle that and get through that and earn what you earn and get to the level you're at. The same with starting a family. There's stress with that. The same with starting a new business or chasing any kind of a dream. Y you know, if, if, if we don't know how to handle stress, then we can't do those things. Or if we want to reduce stress, then we might as well not do any of those things. Everything worth doing has stress, and the body needs to be able and capable of handling that. So, so if if I'm if I'm speaking, and, and whether I'm speaking to a group of high school students or or at a church, or it doesn't matter if it's a convention of uh, um, CEOs, this is the message: that how healthy you are depends on how much stress you can handle, but how successful you are also depends on how much stress you can handle. Uh, this, the, the size of your chiropractic practice is dependent on how much stress you can handle. The number of employees you have in your business is completely dependent on how much stress you can handle. Your income, how much money you produce and earn depends 100% on how much stress you can handle. So my suggestion is get strong so you can take the hits that come along the way and succeed anyways. Become the kind of person that when that stress comes your way, you actually invite it and you embrace it so that you can succeed and grow and excel in life, not shrink and downsize and get small. You need to be big, think big, and embrace that stress. That is absolutely brilliant. That's one of the, the interesting um, conundrums around stress is people think, when I get there, I won't have any stress. Mm. And 
you know, they get there and of course there's more stress because there's just more business, more people, more family, more, 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 more. And, Absolutely. and what creates even more stress on top of that is the fact that we didn't expect it to be there. Um, so I love your message to, to not just expect it, but embrace it and prepare for it and then be strong and be ready and allow it and accept it and embrace it. I, that's just brilliant. So we are coming to the end of our time, but I would love you to just tie this all together with something to leave with our listeners. What can we leave with them to think about for this week following our session today? Absolutely. I, I have two very brief things. Number one, um, you heard my story about how uh, my dad was suffering and a chiropractor helped him. Uh, the question I always ask I want, to, I want your audience to think about this is when my dad was sick, when he was suffering, when he was hurting, was he the only one who suffered or does the whole family suffer? Uh, do, 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 do your children suffer? Do your parents suffer? And, and uh, my message to you is that realize that it's bigger than you, that when you neglect your health and you don't prepare for that inevitable event that's going to come your way, you're not just hurting yourself that so many other people will suffer because of that. That if we take the time and invest our time, energy, and resources into improving our own health, we're actually benefiting our children and our relatives and our spouse and all the people who love and care about us. And, and, and hopefully we're setting the example because the second thing I want to talk about is I truly believe, and this is the title of the last chapter, is I believe we need a new revolution. See, I, I lived through the revolution in Iran. I remember when, when I was in the back of the car, I was five years old, and this uh, protest turned into a riot, and there was things flying and, and, and tear gas being thrown, and, and uh, I, my parents had told me to hide under the, uh, you know, on the bottom of the car, so I wouldn't see this, but I could feel the car shaking, and, and being a kid, I had to look, so I lifted my head up, and what I saw was this man stumbling towards our car, and he had a, he had a white uh, button-up shirt on with gray pants, uh, leather shoes and his hands were in the air as if he's praying and screaming at the sky and as he got closer I couldn't believe my eyes there was actually a giant uh, like a butcher knife stuck in his stomach and uh, and he, he was bleeding and uh, and he, he started to fall and I put my head back down I'll never forget that image but that's what a revolution is now now I'm not asking for that kind of a revolution not all revolutions are bloody, not all revolutions are like that, but a revolution by definition is something that changes everything. You look at, we historically, there's been so many revolutions in the world, you know, in, in America there was the Declaration of Independence and the Civil War, you know, there was then uh, the, the Great Depression and, and, and the Civil Rights Movement and, and you're thinking all oh, those were dip, uh, revolutions because they changed things, but let's go let's go closer. You look at the 1980s and I remember the, the, the invention of the incredible rice Cake. What was the purpose of that rice cake for that people were promoting for your diet? Is They were saying it's fat-free, and they were saying fat is so evil. Uh, we need to cut fat out. And what happened in the 80s? Obesity started to climb. Heart disease and stroke increased, and it went through the roof. So maybe fat wasn't the problem. So then what happened in the 90s? 1991, they announced, oh, sugar is the problem. And listen, I'm not promoting sugar. I think refined sugar should not be part of your diet. So that's the disclaimer. But look at what happened when foods went sugar-free. Those are foods made in factories. They're not natural foods. That's not the same as broccoli or, or, or kale. And so these sugar-free foods, what happened? You look at the 90s, the CDC says the cases of new, new diabetes tripled ever since everything went sugar-free. So that, wasn't, that was a revolution, and that wasn't the problem. And today we're blaming stress. Everybody's saying stress is the problem. That's the reason we're all sick. We're all dying. We're all, we're all having all these problems. And I want you guys to revolt against that. That's not it. It's not the stress because we can't handle the stress. It's because we need to be stronger. So, so you know, and hopefully hopefully you'll get a chance to look through the whole book. Um, uh, but, but it's just three steps. It's very, very simple. Here's the revolution. Number one, learn to trust your innate intelligence. Everyone has it. That's why we talked about genetics. That's why we talked about the nervous system. Your body knows what to do, but you gotta know how and why you should trust that number two regularly get checked by a chiropractor your nervous system needs to be functioning optimally chiropractic is the way and then number three 
not only implement the simple seven but hold yourself accountable start maybe a small group of people who get together and work together hold each other accountable and you know what email me contact me revolution at the stress proof life dot com email me and tell me that you've started one of these groups and I'll stay in touch with you I'll put you in touch with other groups and we're gonna start a movement and we'll change it so that we can pursue our dreams and succeed I'm so grateful that I was able to talk to you today Oh, that is a wonderful message to leave with people. And let's just repeat, because I know everything's going to go fast and some people are driving in their car, but let's just repeat one more time how they can get in touch with you, your website. Absolutely. It, it is, well, the email address is revolution at the stressprooflife.com. Uh, if you're interested in the book, it's on amazon.com. So just search for stressproof, all one word, stressproof, and, and you'll, you'll be able to see the book there. And um, my website is midatlanticclinic.com, all one word. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Mir, for joining us today. It is uh, so refreshing to hear someone explain some of these concepts in such user-friendly and and clear and in entertaining um, stories and examples. So um, it is really a wonderful opportunity for our listeners to get in touch with their own body and their own stress and, and maybe change a lot of how we think about things. So we appreciate having you with us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much. And thanks everyone for listening to Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. If you would like to share the podcast with someone who may not be listening today, of course, we appreciate you spreading the word. Our weekly experts are available for free and you can share this podcast through the iTunes. Um, also on our website, Center for Epigenetic Expression.com or beyondyourwildestgenes.com or just search Beyond Your Wildest Genes. We'll pop right up there and uh, there's lots of internet players that have picked up the podcast and are sharing that with others as well. So thanks you all for listening and we'll talk to you again next week. Bye-bye.